Loki, son of far booty, son of shadows, son of tricks and schemes, you have been found guilty, and your punishment is nigh. The one-eyed man stood straight as a post at the base of the mountain and let the night wind blow his charcoal cloak around him. Odin held his dark, wide-brimmed cap tight against silver hair that rustled round his shoulders like a thousand needles, warping and melting together in a hot forge. Freya studied him carefully. Fury peaked its way through those stony features in small muscle spasms and an uneven curl to his lower lip. That stiffness in his muscles was a desperate attempt to hold himself from strangling the man before him. The wind screamed through the trees that surrounded them in their tiny clearing. The starless night stared down at their gathering. Freya caught a glimpse of a pair of yellow wolf eyes that disappeared immediately in the dark behind branches fanned with green needles. The sharp scent of the blood clinging to the animal's mouth came to her through the aromatic spruce. A recent kill that was all too familiar to her. But the wolf wouldn't dare come any closer than the edge of the trees. Loki glowered at the old man through hollow eyes. His body twisted into a position that made him look almost boneless in the grip of a massive man with a thick red beard. Thor wore his fire openly in his eyes and held the short staff of his hammer close against the twisted creature's throat, muscles bulging and quivering, ready to smash the shaft inward and crumple his prisoner's airway. Thor's mouth was strained in a snarl he didn't bother to hide. By your trickery, good Balder was slain, Odin said. His single eye became a ruby as he said the name. And by your coldness, he remains with hell. You will never be forgiven for your treachery. You will be bound until the end of time. Odin dragged the tip of his index finger through the air. He drew sharp corners and loops that Freya could only see for a split second, shimmering with the faintest golden light before they disappeared again. There was a grumble in the earth as three massive boulders rose from the ground beneath Thor and his prisoner. They were jagged and glossy black, unnaturally called forth from a world that even Freya didn't know. Only Odin had paid the price to obtain that knowledge. He gestured to the stones. May the world of men wipe you from memory. May loneliness gnaw at your heart long after you forget love. And may the angst of meaningless words wrap you in a prison of your own lies. The old man turned his head sharply to a man behind him. A man who carried a golden horn at his side and had the skin inlaid with golden flecks. Heimdall, bring the bonds. The bonds were taken out, and Freya barred her teeth in a smile at the sight of them. They were entrails, not ropes. She could see dark veins and strings of raw fat that knotted their way across the bumpy surface as Heimdall carried them. A son of yours is dead, and serves as your binding, Odin growled so that you will feel your loss against your skin until all memory has gone. The Azir were fierce with their justice, and Odin had no mercy. Thor held Loki in that twisted position as Heimdall knelt with the grotesque knots in his hands to bind him. As soon as they touched his skin, Loki lurched violently. Which son did you kill? Odin, he screamed. Which son? Are those Valley's guts or Narfi's? Narfi's, Odin said with a dead calm. Slain by Valley, as his eyes yellowed and his humanity left him. The wolf at the edge of the trees howled, and Odin's eye darkened. 
The one-eyed man's cloak had already blown mostly away from his warrior's tunic, and he had to rearrange his grip on it to keep the increasing wind from plucking it off his shoulders. Freya's skin prickled at the cold and she felt the familiar drop in air pressure. The storm was on its way. Loki writhed and cursed as Heimdall finished tying the knots and fastened the grisly bonds to the rocks. As he moved, the entrails stretched. Then they twisted. Then they yanked back on his limbs as if alive. Loki screamed vengeance on the Azir and their entire world, screamed that he would destroy what they had built and plunge everything they cared about into the cold, unthinking entropy. Then he was suddenly quiet as the deep blue of his eyes turned soot black. He smiled at the man who had bound him, a sickening smile that nearly split his face. I'll enjoy your death most of all, Heimdall. You and I will meet on Vigrond. You and I are finished, Heimdall replied. He speaks the truth. A grey woman spat from Odin's side. Frigg rarely spoke of the future. She generally kept it to herself, to Odin's eternal torment. She was trembling with rage as well, for it was her son whom Loki had murdered. The truth from the liar's mouth for once. This day is the first mark of Ragnarok. When this wretched creature is freed, the world will tremble. You will fight and kill each other when the last battle comes, Heimdall. Heimdall looked at the man bound with the entrails of his own son. His eyes took a golden gleam as he studied him. Finally, he shrugged. If it is destiny, it is destiny. But I will give you no mind until then. Loki dragged his lips across his teeth in a grin. You will mind, old friend. You will suffer for this day. You will suffer, came Odin's voice, laying heavily across the air with the weight of his hatred. When the end comes, you will shed many tears. If you had only shed the one. Enough, came the voice of one who was usually silent a calm voice that cut through the wind and the voices. Tyr gripped the hilt of his sword with his lone hand, as he always did, but his voice was tense and impatient. Finish it, Odin. The old man nodded and closed his eyes. He gathered his cloak to conceal his tunic and straightened his hat so that the brim cast its shadow over the eyeless half of his face. He wrote another symbol in the air and a serpent appeared shimmering as it came into substance from whichever realm Odin had drawn the rocks. The snake calmly extended itself outward so that Heimdall could take it. This snake will be your tormentor, Oni continued at last. It will drip its venom on you and you will suffer with every drop. May it bring you mania that you will always feel the fever you have caused the rest of us. Heimdall carried it back to Loki and positioned the serpent on a branch so the first drip of poison fell on Loki's forehead. The world erupted in an earthquake, so violent that the trees around them barely held their ground by their roots. Loki screamed, and that scream echoed across the mountains to cause avalanches so heavy they could bury entire towns. Each time he writhed, the world shook with him. When it had subsided only a little, he struggled at the bonds and glared at each of them in turn. He forced a crooked grin. Who transformed my valley to murder his brother? His eyes demanded an answer, but no one spoke. Odin met the creature's eyes with his one, and it was singular only increased its ferocity. Loki's eyes darted among all of those present until finally they rested on Freya. It was you. It was, she replied. He bared his teeth at her with an odd kind of peace, his eyes still darker than the sky above them. Fimble winter will come. You will fight it, but it will come. He writhed in advance under another growing drop of venom. Love will forever bleed dark and gritty in your heart and I will hide you from time itself. He paused. You will know madness as I know it. All your power, and you will be helpless to use it. 
I give you these gifts, my lady. Freya stepped forward, and Freya stored him with a look. The beautiful blonde man nodded at her. You don't frighten me, she said as she hefted her spear. Prepare yourself well for Ragnarok, Loki. If you do yourself the honour of a good fight, the last word you hear will be my name. The drop of venom fell on Loki's face again, and his shrieks racked the earth around him. But his tormented eyes, now blue again and wide with agony, did not leave hers. They promised vengeance, and despite her outward bravery, she wanted to shiver. Thunder cracked in the distance, that unbidden storm approaching. Fimbor winter, he had promised. Three winters with no spring and summer in between. The frost giants were undoubtedly on the move already. Freya tightened her grip on her spear. The Israeli air was dry and seemed to move with the lines of sweltering heat rising from the baked ground, creating illusions of darkness over the dirt that disappeared when one started to walk towards them. Mirages, just the way they happen in stories. The rocky earth split in places for lack of rain to keep it smooth, and here and there a sickly plant struggled for life out of the cracks. You know what causes mirages? Gordon Prince said as he looked across the landscape and adjusted his white hard hat. Gordon's business partner, Paul, raised an eyebrow. The sand's heat is transferred into the air above the ground. Hot air refracts light that comes through cold air, and it refracts the image of the sky to your eyes. Blue, like water. The hot air moves upward to mix with the cold air when it gets hot, making the blue seem to wave just like actual water beneath the wind. He grinned and nodded into the distance. So if someone were to walk across that piece of sand over there by that actual lake, they would appear to be walking on water. Paul looked to where Gordon pointed and smiled. The Sea of Galilee lay just beyond them to the south just far enough away that a mirage made the body of water seem significantly larger than it was. There was a deafening snap as a cloud of splinters and dust danced its way to the top of the excavation site. The crane dropped the large trunk of wood a few feet away from the now open doorway. Ah, they said I was crazy, Paul said, grinning like an idiot. They said we'd never find it. They laughed at me, Igor. The darkness of the entrance was almost a complete black. Gordon was focused on the darkness inside, which should have been more visible with the sun beating its way through the new opening. I don't see the big deal. A soldier, whose name Gordon hadn't bothered to learn, stared into the dark opening as he spoke. Gordon would have done without the soldiers, if he had the choice. Their sponsor had insisted. Political unrest of the region and all. Gordon wished they would at least shut up and let him have his moment. Paul took the gracious approach to the soldier. There's a very real chance that this is Baldur's tomb. The soldier said nothing as he looked down the incline roughly carved into the desert's face. Paul continued. Baldur was the Norse god of light, the son of Odin and Frigg. The soldier was silent. He stared into the doorway of the tomb, still shrouded in shadows despite the dust being almost completely clear. When Odin and Frigg received a prophecy that Baldur would be killed, Paul said, Frigg took a sacred oath from everything in the world, living or not, that it would not harm her son. Gordon imagined the wintry queen demanding a promise from a rock. He smiled when he imagined her getting it. The soldier didn't ask any questions. He didn't ask how a god could die. And Gordon was annoyed that Paul didn't get to explain. Norse gods were interesting precisely because they were mortal, unlike gods in most other mythologies. Because the gods could die, they could be tragic heroes instead of comic relief. When Baldur came close to immortal through his mother's actions, the gods all had a good laugh trying and failing to kill him. Paul did get to explain that, for whatever reason, Frigg didn't bother to get her promise from the mistletoe. Loki, the trickster god, carved the mistletoe into an arrow and tricked Hoda, 
the blind god of darkness and Baldur's brother into using it. Hell, the goddess of the underworld, offered to raise Baldur from the dead if every creature in the world wept for him. Only Loki refused, and Baldur stayed dead. Odin burned his son's body on a funeral pyre atop Baldur's dragon ship. Sounds like Loki was an arsehole, the soldier said. Paul smiled and summed it up pretty well. He tricked the god of shadows into murdering the god of light. Gordon nodded. Loki tricked night into murdering day. The soldier shook his head. If the body was burned, what's in the tomb? Gordon turned and looked at the soldier, raising an eyebrow. Maybe the man was listening after all. Mythologies become what they are over time, Paul said. But they're based on something real. The most fearsome of the gods could have been built on famous warriors or ancient tribal chieftains. The man who became Balder, the god, might be buried here. Gordon and Paul left the soldiers and the two men made their way down the incline to step past the ruined door. Inside, the darkness seemed to swallow the light from their headlamps, expensive as the lamps were. That, Gordon knew, was a nonsense. His eyes were still adjusted to the bright light of the desert. There was enough light to find the way around, and that's what really mattered. Pillars were toppled and were lying shattered on the stone floor. Basins where fires might have been lit for sacrifices were smashed and Gordon thought he saw the grease of sacrificial animals still glimmering on them. In stark contrast to all of this, the statue at the far end of the temple, behind the altar, was fully intact and upright. Gordon's headlamp couldn't banish the fuzziness around the edges of the sculpture. Through the haze, he could see a man's face that was decidedly pointy as it emerged from the carved black stone. Pointy eyebrows hung over eyes that were piercingly sharp despite being carved centuries before. A wicked grin split his face in half to reveal a set of blocky, too large teeth. The razor-sharp corners of the mouth seeming to stretch progressively further towards the long, pointed ears, even as Gordon stood looking at it. The man was robed and his arms were crossed in front of him. His feet were positioned perpendicularly a foot apart, impatiently. If this is Baldur's tomb, Gordon said after a long time, why does it contain a monument to Loki? There was a sound behind them, a scraping of a footstep against the sandy stone, perhaps. Gordon spun on his feet and squinted into the darkness. The dark seemed thicker now, though, somehow consuming even more of the light than it had before. What's the matter? Paul said. Gordon didn't turn his attention away from the darkness. Something was there. He let the silence linger. Didn't you hear that? I didn't hear anything. Something moved, Gordon said. He was sure he had heard something, but the light revealed nothing at all. The sound came again, stretching across a longer length of time. It sounded more like the low growl of a large dog. A bead of cold sweat glided down between his shoulder blades. The feeling of dread was thick in his chest and he could not shove it away. A panic attack? A heart attack? He debated briefly on whether he had taken his baby Ashman in the morning or he had left it in the pack. I'm sure it's fine, Odin, Paul said. Gordon stared at the man, whose features were no longer illuminated by the light that struggled through the space between them. What did you call me? Paul's blurry outline walked next to the statue and rested its elbow on Loki's shoulders. I said, it's fine, Odin. Fenris is still chained. Fenris, the wolf large enough to swallow the world whole. The low growl returned. It was deep, the vibrations crawling through the floor to touch Gordon's feet. There was no sharp bark, 
only the constant grumble, like the motor of some distant, massive machine. Paul, Gordon said, joke's over. Whatever you're doing to make this, my joke on you was played out a long time ago, Odin. It's time to end it. The darkness swelled and Gordon turned to see that the doorway had disappeared, removing whatever illumination the desert sun had tried to offer. Gordon couldn't see Paul's face, but he imagined the man was grinning and he couldn't understand why. The more he stared, the more Paul began to look like the statue next to him. The ground beneath Gordon's feet shook and his headlamp winked out. And so he sets a fire to sear his soul and purge away all that stands in his desperate path. To forge his focus and save the ones for whom he walks his bitter road. Now his illness, cured in flame, sails away on tendrils of smoke until the heavens weep for all he loved. We march to Ragnarok, he says to no one as he hefts his mighty sword. Behind us all we were. Before us only bloody battle. You carry lightning in your eyes, my friend, bolts as numerous as grains of sand. Your burden is nigh, the last to die, for there is fury in my hand. Scrawled onto a wall of the last temple of Loki, before the world burned. <laughs>